All right. <coughs> so uh, let's do a little bit of a review from last week. Uh, this will be a review for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't. This will be good for you as well. Uh, last week we talked uh, about the end of chapter 2 and the first seven verses in chapter 3. Uh, so let me go ahead and read the text and then we'll go back and review about uh, evil. And so chapter 2, verse 25, and then I'll read through uh, at least verse 7 this first time. It says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were, both, and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, or I think the King James says angels. Um, let's talk about evil and attacks of the enemy. We talked about this last week, but somebody help me rem remind me of, of what our conversation entailed last week when it came to uh, plans of the enemy. Created doubt. Imbalance? Created doubt. Created doubt. Thank you. Yep. So every time, every time that we have temptation, right, there's doubt. Did God really say? Remember that? Did God really say? Uh, so he creates doubt, right? Then what happens? Look back at me and give your hand out. You can feel free to look. It's open book. What happens? What's next? Accusation. Accusation, right? Uh, you will not surely die. He makes God out to be the bad guy. So there's an accusat accusatory uh, tone in language here, and you'll see that again tonight. Um, but that's that's something that's uh, part of the plan that Satan uses, right? Did God really say, um, and you will not surely die? He's the bad guy. <coughs> he doesn't want you. Remember we talked about God is a God of... of Yes, you can, you can have anything with the exception of this tree in the, in the garden. Um, but that's not where Satan starts. Satan starts with accusing God of being a bad guy and saying he wants to restrict you. Uh, sometimes, I mentioned last week, sometimes we get in our, in our mind that even the Ten Commandments, you know, you shall not, we think of those as restrictions, that they bind us. They're not, they're not to put us in bondage, they're to give us freedom, right? Um, have no other gods before me, or uh, don't murder, or don't covet. All those kind of things are not to put us in bondage. They're to show us what real life is all about, right? We talked about Jesus uh, last week saying, I've come that you may have life, and not just life, but life to the full, abundant life. Uh, but most of us see God, and I think Satan wants us to see God as one of restrictions. And that's not who God is. We don't see that in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. What else, what else can we say about attacks of the enemy? Doubt? Then we have accusatory language. What else? You have the, you have the professor a little concerned. I see a lot of, <laughs> a lot of glazed looks. I see you divide and conquer. Say again? I see divide, I see divide and conquer. In the Okay, yep, the dividing and conquering, so, you know, the, the Satan, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, division, conquering, things of that sort, okay? 
I, I would ask you guys to go back and review that because I think that's pretty important. Well, let's talk about let's talk about uh, something we did talk about last week because we ran out of time. But um, if you'll notice, we, we go back to the old Bible study things, you know, observation, interpretation, application. We didn't get to the application last week, so let's do it now. Let's spend the next five six minutes on application. And I'll ask you if, if, uh, if Bud and Ann were here, I would say, Ann, what would I say? And, uh, I give her a hard time because there for a while I was saying, so what? What? what what's the point? What, why are we doing the preaching? Why are we doing the sermon? Why are we doing the lesson? And every time you open your Bible, every time you do Bible study, you should ask your question, well, so what? What does this have to do with me? <clears throat> I know there was Adam and Eve. I know something happened in Genesis chapter 3. I know that something was called the fall. So what? What does that mean for me in 2023? How do I live my life? So if you never get to the application, which we were guilty of last, I was guilty of last week, that's, that's something that we need to cover now. So we've already talked about God created good and very good. That's Genesis chapter 1. Uh, in chapter 2, we have mankind uh, giving dominion, naming animals, things of that sort, but no helpmate was found for mankind, Adam. And a helpmate was created out of Adam's side. We've already talked about the, um, the ability to, to uh, again, have a special part in creation. God, God expects mankind to have this relationship with him. But then we get to the text we got to last week, where everything is going to go south, where we ate from the tree. You will surely die. That was the promise. Okay? We'll talk more about that today. But if you, I mean, spoiler alert, it's going to be a constant spiral from here on out. Okay? So somebody help me out with that and say, how can we summarize that to apply to our lives? What does this mean? What is Genesis 1? through, let's say, chapter 3, me for our lives. How do I live my life based upon what I know? Help me out with that. You make yourself aware that the enemy's out there waiting to trip you up intentionally, mm -hmm. and that you have to keep your focus on Christ so that you don't fall into his traps. Yeah, yeah. How many people do you think are aware You know, um, on any level or a level that I think. Yeah, pick any level. I think we, as Christians, all of us on like some subconscious level are aware, but I don't think we take it seriously. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that or not. Mm -hmm. She said, she said, uh, followers of Christ are aware that there's an enemy out there that he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But do we take it seriously? No. I think that's right. I think that's spot on. Um, I think there are people that are not aware. I think there are people that think that Satan is, uh, or the enemy, or evil in general is just, you know, bad karma, or bad luck, or uh, whatever. But no, we're talking about a, a personification of evil is, is the serpent. Is, is, we talked about that last week, right? A hosh, right? In, in Hebrew. So if we don't, if we don't uh, recognize, if we look at the Corinthian passage last week, that he's a ruler of the kingdom on earth. He's a ruler of this world for a certain time until Christ comes back and puts him in his rightful place. Um, we talked a little bit, I think, about spiritual warfare. But I, when, I, when I talk about spiritual warfare, I, I want to be very careful because some people go from one extreme of the other to the other when it comes to spiritual warfare. There's nothing going on. It's just, you know, bad luck or whatever. The <laughs> end of the spectrum is everything is about spiritual warfare. And that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, I'm saying we live in a broken world. Yes, everything is affected by Genesis chapter 3 in the fall. But not everything that happens to you is based upon spiritual warfare. Sometimes it's just your own bad choices. Sometimes it's people around you that don't know they're being used or, um, uh, you know, part of a, part of a plan. Um, sometimes it's just things that happen because of a bad, bad world, right? But don't always think that everything is spiritual warfare because it's not. I don't, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I don't think that's what Scripture teaches. What else? 
I see in there that God gave us plenty, but we we have a tendency people to let people lead us to think we need more, can have better than what we got more. Grass is always greener. On the other side. Car is always nicer. House is always nicer. There's always something, the, the coveting, the greed, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you caught it last week. We didn't spend any time on it as much as I remember, but our, what little I remember, we were talking about the, the temptations, and if you'll notice in that text that I just read for you, there's three different temptations. It was pleasing to the eye. It was good for food. It would make her like God. Same temptation, we did talk about this, because that's yeah. the same temptations that Satan was, or that uh, Jesus was faced with when he meets Satan in the wilderness or in the desert uh, after his baptism. And so it's the same plan. It's, it's the same thing over and over and over again, right? So we've got to be aware of it. We've got to acknowledge it. We've got to recognize that Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay? We all good? We'll move on. We're good. All right? Well, let's get reading then. I'm going to read the end of verse 7, and then I'm going to go in through, uh, let's read through about 14. So then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Uh, let's stop there, verse 13. <clears throat> so, a couple things I want you to see here. Um, in verse 7. We talked about this last week a little bit, but you see the, the, the birth of conscience, right? We, we recognize that uh, there's something that is lost in the garden. And that... that that something that is lost is transparency. Um, we have a birth of conscience, what I call the birth of a conscience. And I'm not the only one that does that. Scholars call this the birth of the conscience. Um, they were ashamed. They were ashamed of their nudity. They saw each other's nudity, and so now we have a now we have an issue. The text says they were both naked. Uh, they sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves loincloths or aprons or whatever your translation says. So I have a question here for you uh, in regard to just verse 7 uh, and your thoughts, of course, but um, what do we do when we realize our sin? What do we typically do when we understand that what we've done is wrong, that it's not God's will? How do we respond? How should we or how? How do we? We, we need to talk about the how should we in a second, but how do we typically respond? We feel ashamed. We what? We feel ashamed. Okay, ashamed. We make excuses. Guilt. We make excuses. Withdraw. We hide it. Withdraw. Hide. Withdraw. Hide it. What's that? Hide. It. Hide. Now, what, is, what does it mean to withdraw or hide? I know what it means. I'm just saying, give me a practical example of that. What does that look like, to withdraw or hide? I think we pull away from God a lot of times. Okay. Okay, so it's not just uh, people around us or, or, you know, things that we can see and touch and feel, but it's God. Mm -hmm. Pulling away from God. Okay. We get in the ship and we go the opposite direction and then above. Okay. Yeah, just like Jonah, we, we get in the ship and we go to Tarshish instead of going to Nineveh. Okay. We start moving ourselves from the things of God, you know, like church. Speaking to others about Christ, is that we start withdrawing from that yep. into our own shell. Yeah. Why do you think we do that? Because I mean, we've all been there, I suppose. I've been there. Why do you think we do that? Why do we? Why do we not? Why do we pull away from God? Because sin separates us from God, and so 
you know, when I walked, when I was walking in sin, I didn't want to be around my Christian friends because they represented something that I was not. And uh, it, it was, it didn't just separate me from God, but it separated me from those people too. So it can't be, it, it doesn't have to be just a direct conviction. It can't be just somebody, it doesn't have to be somebody saying, what you're doing is you're living in sin. It could be, you know, the Holy Spirit convicting you of, hey, I should have, or I shouldn't have, whatever. Yeah? yeah. I wonder how many people, though, uh, I've heard people tell me all the time, I don't go to church because... Hypocrites. Well, hypocrites, or uh, I don't go to church because... And then, and then when you go deeper, you hear the guilt, the shame, mm -hmm. the yeah, withdrawal. They, yeah, they don't feel good enough or... Yeah, I could yeah. never, I could never live up to what you guys are doing, right? There's some kind of expectation that either I couldn't do it or I'm not willing to do it, or I'm as good as people that go there. Yeah. Or I'll feel judged. Or you what? Feeling judged. Or you, or people look down at me, I'm being judged or whatever. Man, if that's not, if that's not something that our society deals with today, man, I don't know. But, you know, anytime people are is, um, accused of something or or uh, told you're wrong, they just say, boy, don't judge me, or whatever. Yeah, that's a big problem. I'll, I want you to be aware of that. Just be thinking, we'll, we'll get more into that here as we go, but I want you to be thinking, how do you, and you don't have to answer this, just think, well, how do you typically respond when you sin, when you're convict, convicted about something you know you shouldn't have done, or you should do, right? Uh, I had a preacher one time, um, was talking in Corinthians, and made the point of the sin of omission and the sin of commission. The sin of omission is things that you do that you know you shouldn't do. Uh, or that's the sin of commission, right? The sin of omission is the things I'm supposed to do. I know that God has called me to go share the gospel with that person. I know that God has you know, called me to X, Y, Z, but I'm not going to do that because it's uncomfortable. That's also sin, right? So I want you to hear, I want you to hear the two types of sin. Um, and don't just think about it being just utterly rebellious when it comes to, I'm going to eat from the tree anyway. It's also obedience in another direction as well. Okay? I think that's enough about verse 7. Um, let's get into, let's get into um, verses 8 and following. Um, and this is a, a typo in your handout. I just noticed that. And that's... It, Verses 8 through 13, we're going to talk about the effects of sin. And not just not just the effects of sin tonight, we'll probably talk about the effects of sin next week as well. If you'll notice it says in verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Lord God. Um, so, as we talked about last week, God, Yahweh had an eye walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The Hebrew, the Hebrew speaks to the voice of God. Uh, so we, the sound that it says here in the ESV, or maybe it says sound in your translation, the Hebrew itself says, you know, alludes to there's a voice of God, you know. So prior to this time, God has been walking in the cool of the day with man and woman. And again, as we talked about last week, we don't know the timeline. We don't know how long that's been going on. But something's different this time. Right? And you're all aware of what that difference is, right? They heard God walking in the garden and they hid themselves. Let me take a look, or let me ask you to turn with me and let's take a look together at um, Ephesians. Go to the New Testament. So, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read again from verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And I want you to hear what Paul says to the church here in Ephesians. This is Ephesians chapter 2, um, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Paul's talking to the church here, of course, and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, 
the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Obviously, he's talking about Satan there, right? Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature, listen, church, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. <clears throat> Let me read verse 8 again for you of Genesis chapter 3. says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We have this effect of sin. The first thing we see when it comes to effect of sin is it's not just Adam and Eve. Now, you fast forward a couple thousand years later, Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus. I said the church. He's talking to the church at Ephesus who should know better. Um, he's just given them a diatribe in chapter 1 about God's goodness, God's faithfulness, uh, why they should be different than the rest of the world. That's the first sentence, and it's one complete sentence, verse 3 through 14 in chapter 1. And then we get to chapter 2, and he's going to say, here's why, here's why you're not living the way you should live. And what he says is, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Before you met Jesus, before you associated your life with Jesus Christ, you are dead in your... What's the promise from Genesis? You will surely die. You will surely die. You will be severed from relationship with God. Right? We talked about this transparency being lost, but it's not just the transparency. It's also, as Dee pointed out, it's the relationship, the complete relationship with God. So, if you don't catch anything else uh, tonight, catch this. Holy God cannot live with unholy things. Will not live with unholy things. Now, that may sound bad. That's bad news for some people. Uh, but only those people who haven't met Jesus. Right? Because I can never be holy enough. But I've associated my, my life with Jesus. And therefore, His righteousness has become my righteousness. His holiness is now my holiness. Does that make sense? So when I die to self, we'll do this again when we baptize on Sunday. We die to self. We're raised to walk in the newness of life. There, there's transformation that takes place from the inside out. Now, notice the past tense language here in Ephesians chapter 2. You were. You, you were dead in your trespasses, right? You were dead in your sins in what you once walked, he says. And you are following the course of this world. What's the course of the world? Just like Adam and Eve did in Genesis chapter 3. You are following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. The spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience. Um, here's another one. I just thought about this. You might look at, at the, the list before the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5. There's another list there that Paul says that this is the way that the, the wicked live. This is the way that the people that don't know Jesus live. Uh, the problem is, church, sometimes we're no different than the world. Sometimes we let the world penetrate us. Uh, we, 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 uh, what's the phrase I want to use? We, uh, we're influenced by the world instead of doing what Christ tells us to do, and that is influence the world, right? We allow the wickedness, the, the, the sons of disobedience, all the stuff, all the garbage to, to uh, infiltrate our lives rather than being that light that we're called to be. Okay? Well, let me show you another one before we turn back to the Old Testament. If you will, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. Uh, Paul has already talked about being justified and first part of the chapter, he says, you're justified by faith. And justified is a legal term. It means not guilty, right? It's a judge, you know, banging his gavel saying, her gavel, whatever, saying not guilty. You know, they're free to go. I remember there was an old song back in the day by Ray Bolts that uh, courtroom, I may have, I mentioned this in here, I'm sure before, but there's a courtroom setting where God the Father is the, the judge, you know, you're sitting at the defense table, you have nothing to offer, you're guilty, you know you're guilty, that kind of thing. 
Um, but at the defense table along with you is Jesus Christ, your defense attorney. Satan, of course, is the accuser. And um, Jesus gets up and uh, there's no defense. There's nothing other than I've been to the cross, I've paid for it. And the Father slams the gavel down and says, not guilty. It's a beautiful song. I mean, um, so anyway, that, that's, that's something that maybe rings a bell for some of you. But here in, here in um, chapter 5, he's talking about justification. He's talking about being not guilty. And then notice what it says in verse 12 and following. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and also so death spread to all men because all sinned. That means you could try harder tomorrow than you did today. And guess what? You're still going to sin. Right? That's bad news. But that's not the end of the story. Right? It's <coughs> okay? For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned, listen, from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So you've got the original Adam, Right? We've got Adam, but we've talked about it in Genesis 1 through 3. Now something better is going to come. Someone better. What is that someone better? But the free gift is not like the trespass. If many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God, and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So scholars call Jesus the prototype. Jesus is the uh, what Adam was supposed to be all along. Walking in the cool of the day with God the Father. This is the effect of sin. Uh, th these are the things that we don't, we don't want to acknowledge, we don't want to recognize because we know we're sinners. But we forget about being saved by grace. Okay? And I, I want you to see what, is, what does God do about sin? Right? Yes, of course, he, there has to be a sacrifice. There has to be a reckoning. But Jesus Christ comes willingly, and, and Paul records it here for us, um, that, that God makes it right through Jesus Christ. Verse 16, the free gift is not like um, the result of that one man's sin, but the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. That's the guilt. That's the shame that we talked about a while ago, right? That's the things that make us hide, that makes us withdraw. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Again, justification means not guilty. So in my Bible, I have out in the, in the column, right, up, right by justification, not guilty. I'm not guilty not based upon what I do. I'm not guilty based upon what Christ did for me. Okay? That is the gospel, church. That is good news. There's nothing we can do to stand before God one day and say, I fed the homeless. I, those of us, in, if you did your Sunday school lesson today, uh, those in my class, we're talking about the sheep and the goats. We talked about it at dinner a little ago. Uh, you guys know Matthew chapter 25, right? But goats on this side, on this side, uh, sheep on this side, right? He's the dividing prophet. Lord, didn't we go to church? Didn't we feed the homeless? Didn't we, didn't we take care of people that needed clothing? Didn't we, didn't we, didn't we? And he will say, what? Well, Get away from me. I never knew you. Right? Now, if you don't, if that's not an incentive to do uh, heart stuff, right? Um, God is a heart surgeon. He wants to give you a new heart. And, and the trouble is, it's all too often we're pretty happy with our heart. And as I've mentioned many times in here before, um, the prophet Jeremiah says, above all else, the heart is desperately wicked. And as long as you hang on to that wicked heart, guess what? You might be motivated to do things, but it's all about religion. It's not about, or tradition, or to make yourself feel better. But you're still far from God. Uh, I want you to hear that. It has to be a heart issue. It has to be a heart issue. Your motivation cannot be just doing things. It's, it's letting God do something in your life so that, the reason that you serve, the reason that you feed the homeless, the reason you visit prisoners, the reason you do the things you do is because of what Christ has done for you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anybody resonate? Okay. 
I want you to begin to see the effects of sin, what sin does to us. Because we, I think most people think, at least a lot of people think, that sin is just stubbing our toe. Oops, I did it again, right? I told the little white lie. Um, well, you know, I, I, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but all I have to do is say my prayers tonight and ask for forgiveness, and God's a gracious God, and so He's going to be gracious to me, and everything's going to be okay. Well, that mentality, that mentality minimizes um, the effects of sin, but more so it minimizes what Christ had to do when He went to the cross. I, I've told you last week, those of you who were here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17-21, he became sin for us. That's the effects of sin. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 3. When we eat from the tree, and let's not blame Adam and Eve. When we eat from the tree, when we fall into temptation, temptation is not a sin. But if we hang around there long enough, we're going to sin, right? Amen. And when we do so, then what happens? Now there's got to be, a, there's a price to be paid. And the price is God in the flesh. God incarnate going to the cross and, and, and being whipped 39 times and, and being nailed to the cross and being humiliated uh, all because of sin. So we should not minimize, uh, and I'm not, please don't think that I'm any more spiritual than you are. I'm not. I'm probably less spiritual than you are. I'm just saying, I have to get a better understanding of what sin, what my sin does Toward God. And I hope that you're on that path as well. I hope that's part of our conversation. Okay? Uh, well, I'm not going to read the rest of it. You can read it. But all the way through verse 21, he speaks about uh, the effects of sin and the prototype, Jesus Christ being the, the original plan that God had in mind all along. That Adam would do, that if Adam would do what Adam did, now we have the law. The law is going to give us, you know, um, the things that shows us we can never add up, therefore we know we're sinners. That's what the law is, Paul would say. It shows us that we need a Savior. Obviously the Savior is Jesus Christ, and He is the prototype. He is the one that, you guys know what prototype is, don't you? Right, the original. He's the one that, the, the idea, right, perfection. Okay? Let's move on. Verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, here's where an interesting thing happens. There's a guy named Clark Pennick, um, who's a theologian, uh, who's well known um, for something called open theism. And I don't believe in open theism. What I mean by open theism, let me define it for you real quick. Pennick holds the idea that um, God doesn't know anything until it happens. Right? That God is sovereign, that God created everything, but he doesn't know anything until it happens. So when he asks Adam, where are you, that he's actually asking Adam. Adam's still there hiding somewhere, and God can't see him. I don't buy that. I think God is above space. He's above time. We've talked about that before. He's sovereign. Um, but I want you to understand that this is where a lot of, if you hear, does anybody know Clark Panic? Anybody heard? Anybody heard the name Greg Boyd? Okay, good. Uh, Greg Boyd's a great preacher, but he's an open theist. And if you don't know that going in, you're going to buy some of this stuff, right? And it's not just Genesis chapter 3. It's throughout Scripture, right? They make a good case for open theism. It's just not. It's not biblical. That's that's what I'm saying. Okay. So why does if if God is outside of time and space, if God is completely sovereign, if God is omniscient and He knows everything, why would God ask the question? He Where was, are you? He was giving him a chance to come out and repent, <coughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. But. Yeah. Um, do you, ex do, you, do you recognize the effects of sin? Do you, do you confess? Do you repent? Do you, we've talked about repent here before, but do you confess? Do you acknowledge what you did or what you didn't do with sin? Right? And you guys know the definition of sin, by the way? The word of martia is the missing the mark, right? So if you think of a bullseye, um, and, and obviously the bullseye, 50 points or whatever the dark board says, that idea of hitting the bullseye, that's the idea. Every time you don't hit the bullseye, you're missing the mark. That's the Greek, that's the Greek picture, the martia, of what sin is. Right? So whether it's you do something you shouldn't do or you don't do something that you know you should do, it is sin, right? Commission, omission. 
But here, uh, God asks in an attempt to convince man of the effects of sin. Do you recognize what you've done? Remember what I told you, right? You know, I, I've done this with my kids all too often, too many times to count. More times than I'd like to count. Embarrassing. And you've probably done it as well. You know. Remember when I said, or, you know, maybe you're driving home late one night, you've been at a party, you go to pick them up, whatever it is, right? Remember I told you, you know why I preach to you so much? All this kind of stuff. And you want to talk about judgmental, Suzanne. This is where it comes to judgmental, right? We're quick to do that with our kids. We don't do that with ourselves enough, is what I'm saying. Right? Um, and here, here you get God asking, where are you? And, and I think this is the prime opportunity for them to confess, to recognize that, hey, we have... We have surely severed relationship. This is what death is all about. Severing relationship with God. And so it's almost like it's almost like a shepherd seeking his sheep. Uh, you know, sensing care, even after judgment. Even, you know, was God surprised by what Adam and Eve did? No, we talked about that last week. He's not surprised by anything. He knows what's going to happen. He knows when the tree's in the middle of the garden, you will surely die. They're going to go eat from the tree. Because they doubted, because they doubted God, and because of the accusations of Satan, because of the enemy, right? Again, the effects of sin. I, this is this is. Uh, I've been up here on the stage and I've showed you that for many times. The, the the word in Hebrew is shuv, to turn around. Right? I confess, I recognize that I'm far away from God, and I do a 180. The word is shuv, s h u v. If I, if I do a 180 and I get back on track with God, I'm good. That, that's what it means to repent. But you can't just confess and say, yeah, what I did was wrong. 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 But if you never repent, if you never turn away and go back this way toward God, you've never shoot. You've never, you've never made that connection with God. Does that make sense? You follow? Confession and repentance are two different things. Um, you, can, you can say, well, I, I feel guilty about that. That's not repentance. There's a lot of people who feel guilty about a lot of things. But you've got to repent, right? You've got to get back on track. You've got to shoot. You've got to turn around and go the other way. The other way. And what happens, what happens, prodigal son, prodigal daughter, when you come to your senses, what it says in Luke 15, you come to your senses. You get up from the pigsty. You get up from your sin. You get up from your righteous living, you know, your, your, your partying or whatever. And you go back home being willing to be a slave. And where's the father? He's... He's running out, and he's looking at the end of the driveway, waiting for you to return. Isn't that a great picture? That, that's, the, that's the prodigal son story. That's for all of us, right? So this is a shepherd seeking his sheep. This is the, even after you will surely die, he still cares enough to want relationship with you, want relationship with me. That's amazing to me. That's the gospel, even in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 10. So how does Adam answer the question? Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Anybody see anything, any weird things there? Anything that sticks out to you? Hi. Hi. I'm about yeah. <laughs> Remember we talked about this last week, but those of you who weren't here last week, um, the first part of the text, the first part of the chapter says that the serpent was craftier than any other creature. And then we find that uh, he has Eve alone. Right? So there's this lack of community. And the point I was trying to make last week is we need each other. This is why community is so important. Um, this idea, there's, there's all kinds of articles out there right now. You've probably all heard them before. Everybody hates the church right now. They love Jesus, but they hate the church. Right? Um, I mean, I see it all the time. Maybe you don't, but I, I see it all the time, and I hear people say that all the time. And um, you need community. That's what Satan wants. To, Jake mentioned it a while ago. He's about stealing, killing, and destroying, picking people off one by one. Right? If I can get you alone, that's when I can really deal with you. Right? That's what he does with Eve. So here in verse ten, Adam is all about himself. Right? He never mentions the helpmate. Not yet. <laughs> I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid myself. Right? So he only speaks for himself. Only speaks for himself. And notice he doesn't answer the question, does he? 
What is the question? Where, where, and what is what does Adam answer with? Why? I heard you. I realized I was naked. I was afraid. I hid. That's the why. But he never answers the where. When God asks you a question, make sure you answer the right question. You know what I'm saying? When you give, when you start, when you start giving excuses to God, um, no, I think about Moses. I don't have a lot of time here, but I think about Moses, right, in Exodus chapter three, where God says, "No, you're God. Yeah. No. Do you know who I am, God? Of course, He knows who you are, <laughs> right? But we give all kinds of excuses to God of why I can't, why I can't. No, you're the God. You're, you're the one that I've. I have planned this from the very beginning, right? You're going to go to Pharaoh. And you're going to tell him to let my people go. And guess what he's going to do? After ten plagues, he's going to let the Israelites go. That's what's going to happen. And, and it's almost like, you know, I hear Moses stomping around in the dirt thinking, oh my God, I don't want to do this. I can't speak. I can't this. I can't this. Or what about, and this might be a nerve, but what about those of you who think, oh, I'm just too old. I can't teach a Sunday school class anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I've been, I've done my time. Let the younger generation do it, or whatever. No, <coughs> that's that's not what God calls us to do. We're we're, we're called to follow Jesus. Um, Don't you think it's all out of fear? You know, Adam was afraid. Moses was afraid. Yep. Yeah, you're putting me in charge of all these people. No, and I, and I think that's I think I think these things we've been talking about: guilt, fear. And shame are all in woven. Let's talk about shame for a second. What is shame? <laughs> oh, you had your hand up. What were you going to say? You had your hand up. What were you going to say? <laughs> shame is who I am, not what I did. Shame, yeah, shame kind of overtakes you, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I want you to hear this. God created, remember, God created everything good or very good. Yet Adam sees something that he's not happy with. I realize I was naked. Now I'm afraid. I've lost transparency. Now I'm afraid. Right? So it's 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 almost like a slap in the face towards God's creation. <coughs> Look back at Genesis chapter 1. Everything is good. When he creates mankind, it is very good. But why would you, you know, feel like you have to create these loincloths or aprons or whatever, these fig leaves? Right? It's because you're fearful. It's because you, you, you feel guilty. It's because shame, <coughs> right? And shame will overtake you. I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer. All of our sin goes back to identity. All of our sin goes back to identity. When you recognize who you are in Christ, right, that's a whole different ballgame. But if you're outside of Christ, if you're not living in Christ, as Paul would say, then your identity is all screwed up. Then you're always going to have the guilt. You're always going to have the shame. You're always going to have the identity issues, right? And what does Satan do? You're not good enough. You don't look good. I mean, I could. I mean, I could go on. You know it all, right? That happens from a very early age, by the way. I mean, it happens from a very early age. And the more you start buying into that lie, guess what? The more you believe it, and you believe it, and you believe it, and then then it's just a it's a bad bad place to be. So, I I have my identity issues. I'm sure you have your own identity issues. But let's remember we are not we are not just flesh and bone. We are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I am I'm no longer myself. I I died to myself. I, I'm not the old man I used to be. I'm now in Christ Jesus. And so I hear the Holy Spirit, you know, say, so act like it. So live like it. You know? Be different than you were yesterday. Right? Don't go back to that old way of life. The, the proverb says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a sinner returns to his folly. Why would you keep going back? That tastes pretty good. That's pretty graphic, but that's what Scripture says. Right? 
So it's about identity. Uh, verse 11. So God said, who told you you were naked? Uh, you've been, who you been having conversations with? Man, we, we used to, we used to hang out. We used to walk in the cool of the day. Who told you you were naked? This is a, this is a going back to this, you know, recognition. You're going to recognize something, and you're going to recognize now your transparency is lost. It's not you will sure to die; it's you're dead now, right? We just read that from Ephesians chapter two. You, you, you've got this; you're, you're dead. You severed relationship with God. And then he says, have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? God is omniscient. God knows exactly what's happened, and yet he still asks the question. Uh, those two questions, who told you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you to eat? This is confession over condemnation. This is a, this is a way in which God is ready, willing, and able to meet you at the end of the driveway when you return home. When you come to your senses, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've mentioned to some of you in here, uh, Southwestern, about uh, me and a buddy, he had a sister that was an addict, and um, he took her to rehab so many times, so many times. And, and with different rehabs all the time. And, um, she would get clean for a while and everything would be right, you know, but she would eventually go back to the same old crowd. When you go back to the same old crowd, you know what happens, right? And you have to hit you have to hit the bottom of the barrel. You have to hit the bottom of the barrel. You have to get to the lowest of the low. And then God is there for you. And then Christ is ready to, to help you kind of thing. And that's kind of where she was. Um, she ended up over overdosing, sadly. But uh, the point is, is you can't, um, they have to do it for themselves. You have to hit the bottom of the barrel. You have to hit the bottom of the barrel. They have to hit the bottom of the barrel. But if you never confess, that's the problem. If you never repent, that's an issue, right? I want you to see, though, God is not about condemnation, first and foremost. He is interested in confession. He's interested in Adam recognizing his sin, what the effects of sin are, and will you return? Will you come back? Right? That's true for us as well, right? When you confess your sins, when the Holy Spirit tells you, hey, you shouldn't have done that or you should have done that, the quickest way out, the quickest, and this is not a, I mean, I'm not saying uh, way out in the sense that we're uh, attempting to manipulate whatever God does. There, there are still consequences for our sin. But I'm saying that the best way to peace is to confess, to repent. To get back on track with God. To be in that right relationship with God. Okay? Can't say a whole lot about that because of time, but if I need to expand on that, I will. Um, I just want you to hear, I want you to hear me say, do it as quickly as possible, man. Don't wait. Don't wait to confess, repent. Get right with God. And I I've had people tell me in the past, well, I'm just, I'm young, I'm going to live my life for a while, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do all that stuff later, you know. I'm not really a religious person, I don't need the church, I, I'm a spiritual person, I, I don't really heard it all, man. But, but there's no, there's no uh, desire for them to confess and repent and get right with God. And you never know what's going to happen, right? Um, the idea of, you know, you only live once, yeah, it's true, but you better live it the, the way you should live it. I want you to see, though, that God is not interested in condemnation at, at the outset. He's more interested in confession. He's interested in heart change. So we have the ability to see the effects of sin. If you haven't picked up on that now, you'll pick up on it in Genesis chapter 4, where Cain kills Brother Abel, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, where Noah, uh, every inclination of mankind was evil, desperately wicked. That's all we ever thought about. And God decides that he's going to start all over again. He's going to erase creation. He's going to blot out mankind and all creatures from the earth. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. Chapter 11 again, the Tower of Babel. We've got this spiraling downhill, right? And that, that's the whole point of Genesis 1 through 11 is the effects of sin and we're going farther and farther and farther away from God. Um, 
And there's a time or two where it seems like the light bulb comes on and Seth and he begins to call out upon the name of the Lord, but then we go right back into the same old path. Or Noah gets off the ark and he makes sacrifice, but then he's <coughs> drunk in the tent. Um, I mean, it's one thing after another, right? We, we get it for a little bit and then we go back to the little default mode. The default mode is where we don't want to be, and that's the effects of sin. That's Genesis chapter, chapter 3. Okay? Verses 12 and 13, I'll take these together. Uh, the man said, The woman whom you gave me, to, to, me be with, uh, to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Uh, here's the blame game. So who's Adam blame? God. Both of them. Both of them. The woman and God. The woman that you gave me. <laughs> What's the effects of sin? Yeah, but everybody's doing it. Right? Or, or yeah, God, but you're a gracious God. You've done it before, you'll do it again. I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do over here. Because I know you're a gracious God. You'll, you'll, as, soon as, I, as soon as I come back to you, you That whole mentality is so messed up. And it's so screwed up. But I want you to see that he doesn't blame just Eve. He blames God as well. And so this is where, instead of relationship, walking in the cool of the day with the Lord God, Yahweh Adam and I. Now he's accusing God. Now Adam. Remember, he Eve ate first. He was with her. He ate as well. Now it's not the serpent accusing God. Now it's Adam accusing God. I should never be in this place in the first place. Why would you even put a tree in the middle of the garden? We give all kinds of excuses to God. Right? Um, and I... I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. I think Satan knows exactly where you're weak. I think he's got a good idea. And it's not that he's omniscient, he doesn't know everything, because only God knows everything. But I think because of our patterns, he, let's say, let's say I have a problem, uh, I have a problem gambling. I don't. I don't have a problem gambling. <laughs> well, well, let's say I have a problem gambling. Uh, the next time I'm by myself in a, in a grocery store and there's lottery tickets on sale, what am I likely to do? I don't, I'm not against the lottery. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Um, Satan, Satan puts these things in our path. There, there are things that, based upon our patterns, right? Um, and he doesn't have to do a whole lot of work on me. I mean, I, I do it myself. I just want you to be aware of that. that um, accusation now is, is huge, and so we blame God. You know, we, we why would you? Well, yeah, why would you send me to so and so? I, I don't want to. I don't want to see so and so. I don't want to hear from so and so. Why would you send me to Nineveh, God? You're a gracious God, and I know exactly what you're going to do to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. So he goes down. He buys a ticket, and he goes down, and he goes to Tarshish. Right? You hear that? Repetitive language. Make a decision. Do the things, right? You're blaming God. You're blaming God. You're blaming God. God saves him from the fish. Then what happens? And he's sitting underneath a tree that God has provided. And then he blames God for the worm and eats the tree. I mean, there's this blame game going on over and over and over again. We look at Adam and we look at Jonah and we look at all the other prophets and everybody else and we think, how foolish can you be? But we never look in the mirror and go, how foolish can you be? Right? We are all those people. Um, and they notice the different responses from Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam says, hey, the woman you gave me to be with, she, he gives it excuses. But the Lord God, Yahweh Adonai, says to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, I ate. Some translations say deceived. Uh, other translations say tricked. Uh, there is a, there's a sense of deception. I think deceived, deception is, is the... Better picture here in the Hebrew. Um, remember, remember we talked about the first part of the chapter, the serpent is more crafty. That word crafty comes into play here again. And, and crafty, not in the sense that, you know, uh, well, it's in the sense of manipulation, of evil, of wickedness. And so Eve recognizes, man, what I did was wrong. What, what, uh, I was deceived. Uh, Maybe it did look good. Maybe it was good for food. Um, now I know I can't be like God. 
and uh, and I ate. So she comes to terms with that. Um, man, what's the right response when we see? Let me let me turn you to a couple of, of places that I hope that you'll consider. First is a verse in Proverbs. This is a great verse to uh, memorize if you don't already know it. Proverbs chapter one. Verse 7. The English Standard Version says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. When we talk about fear, we're not talking about the, the hair on the back of our neck standing up. We're talking about a, a, a holy awe. Uh, I was talking with somebody today. We were talking about Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, where he's called by God. And he just sees the train, he just sees the tail of God's robe. And he falls prostrate. He says, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. Right? Well, how I can't even be here, man? What am I doing here? And the only thing, the only response he knows to do is fall prostrate and to worship. Right? <clears throat> that, that kind of fear is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about God's going to get you with lightning. I don't think that's what the proverb is talking about. But he goes on to say, that's the beginning of knowledge, right? When you understand who God is, that, that he's the guy, he's, he's the one that's waiting at the end of the driveway. He's waiting for you to come back. When you understand that goodness, when you understand the goodness of God, um, that's the beginning of knowledge. But notice the last phrase of that, that verse. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word nabal. This is the, the Hebrew word nabal is um, fool. And there's not one time in Scripture where a fool is ever considered uh, at all. I mean, they're just, you know better, and yet you do your own thing. Uh, it's, it's the word moron. And so, um, it's, it's, I know better, but I'm going to do what I want to do. So, uh, you might memorize Proverbs 1 7. I always, like I mentioned before, I, I write it on a, a card index card and I'll put it in front of me so I'm at a red light or whatever I'm reading for a while. And I'll do that until I memorize certain text or whatever. But I'm encouraging you however you memorize, that's a good way to memorize. The other thing I want to turn you to is Psalm 32. We're almost done. I'm going to read uh, fairly quickly here. Um, and just hear the language that the psalmist used. Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression... By the way, do you guys know, uh, you've probably heard this before, but scholars think that Psalm 51 is written first. Psalm 51 is the psalm where David has been convicted by his sin with Bathsheba. Well, he's gone to God, he's asked for, he's confessed, he's asked for repentance, he's asked for forgiveness. Here's what he writes now in, in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man who against the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, it's not that God has hands, but the, the psalmist is using this anthropomorphic language to say, uh, you need to do something about this. You need to, you need to confess. You need to repent. Uh, by the way, this is a good thing. This, this is the, the Bible says God disciplines those He loves. Right? When He does this in Revelation, those of you in Revelation studying Revelation, when He does this, and there is no more Holy Spirit, that's not a good place to be. Right? So make sure you're grateful for God's discipline too. But look what he says. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you. Now listen to what happens. I acknowledge, I confess, hey, I, I, yes, I sinned. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You know, God's in the business of, he wants you to confess before he condemns. Right? Condemnation comes from Satan. Now, judgment comes from God eventually, but He wants you to confess. He wants you to get right with God. Um, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. That's still today, by the way. 
Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Praise the Lord. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with an eye upon you. Be not like the horse, the mule, without understanding. Don't be a fool, which must be curved and bit and bridled, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. What allows you to be upright in heart? It's confession. It's repentance. It's getting right with God. Uh, we'll finish up or attempt to finish up uh, chapter 3 next week, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, I guess the takeaway, the summary for tonight is the effects of sin. What are, what are sin? Don't just think that it's a, uh, oops, oops, I did it again. I should write a song. Um, and, and minimizing grace, you know, how often are we prone to minimize grace? How about our sin is what, what took Jesus to the cross? Are we all good? Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, concerns, disagreements? Hey, I have a comment. Uh, you might have talked about this last week because I was not here. But you know what? Even through this, it's like they took an eight, took an eight, they took an eight. And then kind of the book, you know, and then we died. And the book into that is kind of like Jesus, where he said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you for the remission. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like he, he always takes something that we did bad and turns around and turns something good out of it. Anybody else? Would you pray for us? Yeah. Okay. You mind? No, not at all. Father God, we come before you this evening. We thank you for who you are, who you will always be. We thank you for the lessons that we've received this evening that we apply them to our hearts. Live our lives wholly for you. God, be with those that were not able to be here this evening. We ask for your protection for us as we leave and go about our different places. Thank you for the opportunity for community that we can get together as one body. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.